Welcome to Warhammer 40,000 10th edition. I'm Stephen Box from Vanguard Tactics and I'm going to teach you how to play. Warhammer 40,000 is a tabletop strategy game that allows you to wield your favourite armies, whether you are defending humanity, one of the alien races, or maybe even a slave to darkness. In a game of Warhammer 40,000, there are five battle rounds. And in one battle round, it will consist of a player turn for each of the two players. In those turns, those players will get the opportunity to score as many points as they possibly can on the primary and secondary objectives, using their force to move around the table and hopefully to destroy some of their opponent's models. A game of Warhammer 40,000 consists of five battle rounds, and a battle round will consist of a turn for each of the two players. In those turns, those players will have the opportunity to score as many mission objectives as they possibly can, and sometimes that does mean destroying their opponent's units. In a player turn, it will consist of five phases. The first phase being the command phase, where they can use their army abilities, they can score points and also check for morale. Then we'll move on to the movement phase, which is where the miniatures will move around the table trying to capture different objectives or set themselves up for a fantastic firing position. The next part is now the shooting phase. Players will utilize all the weapons in their army to try and destroy as much as they possibly can from range. Then we're into the charge phase, and this is an element where players will use their models, which are fantastic in combat, to get them into the fight to allow them to then fight in the fight phase. Once all players have completed their five phases, then we'll move on to the other player. To muster your army in Warhammer 40,000, you first of all need to pick a faction. For example, we've got the Space Marines. They're gonna get an army rule for being a Space Marine, which is called Oath of Moment. They're then gonna be put into a detachment. This detachment will unlock certain extra abilities. It will also give you some enhancements and some stratagems to use across the course of the game. The next thing you need to do is pick one of the characters in the book to be your warlord. This is the character that's gonna lead your army into battle. Once you've picked your character to lead your army, the next thing you're gonna need to do is pick all the other units that you want to include in your army. Each unit has a points associated to it, depending on how powerful it is. And you then need to bring that up to a certain total that you've agreed with your opponent to keep the game fair and balanced. For the Space Marine Force today, We've got the character in Warlord, the Librarian in Terminator armor. He has been signed to a unit, the Terminators. He'll give them some extra abilities by being the leader of that squad. We've also got five Infernus Marines, we've got five Stern Guard veterans, and then we've got the Ballista Strednaught that'll be offering some ranged firepower from distance. And then for the Tyranid Force, the alien race, the invaders, the character that's leading the force is the Tyranid Prime. We've then also got 20 Termagants. We've got three Von Ryan's Leapers. We've got five Barbed Gaunts. We've got the massive and terrifying Screamer Killer. Once you've mustered your forces, you then need to determine a mission. And in order to do so, you're gonna pick a series of cards to tell you exactly how you're gonna set up the battlefield, and then also any specific mission rules on how you can score those ever important mission points. The mission parameters for today, players, We'll be using the hammer and anvil deployment. We're then going to have one objective straight in the middle of the table, and we're going to be trying to take and hold the center objective. Players will score five victory points if they can hold that center objective when it comes to their command phase. So we know the mission, you're going to need a table, you're going to need some terrain, you're going to need two forces, and then you're going to need some dice and a tape measure. You're also going to need two players. Today we've got Michael who's going to be playing the Tyranids and we've got Jordan that's going to be taking on the Space Marines. So for deployment first of all players need to roll a dice each and we're going to see who is going to deploy first. This is called the deployment roll off. So Jordan's won the roll and Jordan can now decide if he places the first unit or he's going to force Michael to deploy that first unit. Then players going to alternate deploying a unit each until all the units are on the table. So in all of Jordan's cunning he's decided to make Michael deploy the first unit. Now Michael needs to deploy one of his units up to 11 inches onto this table. That's basically a third of this battle map that we're playing on. Michael's need to deploy his models anywhere in that area but they do need to be in unit coherency. Now this basically means keeping all your units nice and close and not getting them too far from each other. So unit coherency is two inches. So that means you need one of your models to be within two inches of another model from its same unit. Unless that unit goes beyond seven or more models, in which point you need a model within two inches of two friendly models. Now Michael has a very special rule on his leapers. 
they have the infiltrate. Now this is a universal special rule. Universal special rules are a common language for these rules that are going to appear multiple times throughout all the different indexes and armies in the game. So the infiltrate one allows you to set up your unit over nine inches away from your opponent's deployment zone and their models. But this does mean those units can be getting very close to the enemy turn one. Jordan has a very special rule on his terminators. They have a universal special rule called deep strike. Now deep strike allows them to start up in the atmosphere and then deep strike down onto the tabletop in a later turn, allowing him to really surprise Michael with their deployment. So now both armies are either fully deployed on the tabletop, they're either infiltrating or they might be in deep strike. Players now need to roll off once more and the winner of this roll off has to go first. There's no choice involved. You absolutely have to go first if you win this roll. So let's see who's gonna be taking the first turn. So Michael's won the roll off, so that means it's gonna be a Tyranid turn one in the first battle round of the game. The first phase of the game is the command phase and both players will receive one command point each. These can be spent later on for things like a command point reroll or other really cool stratagems that are either in the core rules of the game or found in their army detachments. We're gonna be using just the core stratagems in today's game. Once you've done your CP, you'll then need to use any command abilities that you have. Now, in these rules that we're not using any of those command abilities, just to make this a little bit more streamlined but players in this phase will also check for any battle shock and there won't be any because the armies are completely fully functioning at this time and also they'll score any points but we only score points from turn two onwards so we're going to move straight on to Michael's first movement phase. Michael's going to first of all move the leapers now they've got a movement value of 10 inches and you'll see this on your data sheet he doesn't quite have enough movement to go up and over the terrain, so he's just gonna move around it. And Michael's gonna move from the front of the base to the front of the base. This is classified as a normal move and will later allow him to charge or shoot later on in the game. Next up, Michael's gonna advance the Termagons. Now, and making an advance move means you roll a D6 and add that result to your normal movement characteristic. Their normal characteristic is six, again found on the data sheet. Michael's rolled a one, which allows him to move one extra inch closer to that objective. By advancing would normally stop him from shooting unless he's got any particular rules that allow him to still shoot whilst making this advance or run move. Next up, Michael is gonna move his Screamer Killer. Now he's only gonna move a normal move, which is 10 inches towards the middle of the objective, and this will allow Michael to shoot the Screamer Killer later on in the game. Next up is the Tyranid Prime. Now the Tyranid Prime is currently on the piece of terrain and in order to get down from there, he can use the fly keyword and when doing so, you measure diagonally towards the place where you want to end. And his base move is 12 inches. If Michael didn't have the fly keyword, what you'd have to do is measure vertically down and then across. Next up, Michael is gonna make a normal move with the barbed gorns. Now what he's gonna do is set himself up within range of 24 inches because that is the range of their gun so that he can not only shoot this turn but maybe even get some benefits next turn. To kick off the shooting phase you first of all need to pick one of your units that is actually eligible to shoot. Now Michael's chosen the Termagorns. Now the Termagorns have an, the assault special rule on their weapon which allows them to advance and still shoot later on in that turn. So Michael with this unit of Termagants, needs to first of all pick a unit that is within range of its weapons. And the range of its weapons is 18 inches. As we've determined, the Stern Guard veterans are within 18 inches of some of those models, so some of those models will be able to fire against the Stern Guard veterans. He then needs to decide who has visibility, because you can only shoot what you can see. Now we've got five models here that can see, but the others are too far behind the terrain and those walls will be blocking their visibility. So that means Michael has five of its Termagants that can make attacks. So to make an attack, what you need to do is roll one dice for each of the attacks characteristics on your weapon. Now the Flesh Borers have one attack each. Michael's got five models, so that's gonna be five dice that Michael can roll all together in one go just to save a little bit of time. We call this fast rolling. So Michael first of all needs to roll to hit and he needs to check what he needs on his ballistic skill. It's a four plus. So as you can see here, we've got three that have been successful because it's a four or more, and the other two are gonna fail. So now Michael's hit with three. We then need to see if they actually can hurt the Space Marines. So you need to check the strength of the weapon, which in this case is five, versus the toughness of the target, in which point is four. And you'll see this on the data sheet of the Space Marines. So if your strength is equal to the toughness of a unit, you would need fours. 
If your strength is greater than the target's toughness, which it is in this case, you would need threes being slightly easier because you're stronger than they are tough. If, however, you are double the strength of their toughness, then you would only need twos. So as you can see here, we've got two successful wounds and one which has failed. Now two have successfully wounded those Stern Guard veterans. Jordan has a chance to hopefully save them. So what Jordan needs to do is check the saving throw and this is how good the armor value is. And as you can see, it's a three plus on the data sheet. If Jordan rolls any threes, he'll negate those wounds. And as you can see, Jordan has shrugged off both of those with rolling a four and a five, which is greater than the saving value which means they're successful and no stern guard will be dying from this shooting attack. So we're now going to go with the barbed gaunts. They have a 24 inch range. We've determined the visibility and you need to look for true line of sight. So can your models actually see your opponent's models? So Michael's determined that three of the barbed gaunts are able to shoot the stern guard veterans and then the other two that can't see can shoot somewhere else. This is called split firing and he's going to put those shots into the dreadnought. So Michael has a weapon here that is a D6 shot weapon. So that means it's not a fixed number of shots, it's actually random. So what Michael needs to do is roll one D6 for each of the models that's gonna fire and that's gonna determine how many shots this unit gets. Michael's rolled two sixes in a two, so that's 14 total shots. But this unit has a universal special rule called blast. Now when your unit has blast, you're gonna add one shot per five models in the enemy unit. So we've got a unit of five, so each of these barbed gaunts will shoot one more shot each. So that now is gonna be a total of 17 shots. 14 plus three, 17, and now we're gonna to need to roll to see who can hit. These barbed gaunts, they hit on four, so we're gonna remove all of the fails. Now the successes will be taken through to the wound roll again. And the strength of this attack is five, so once more needs threes to wound the target. Now there is zero armor penetration on these saves, which means we don't need to modify Jordan's armor saving throw in any way whatsoever. So he's just gonna get his base save of a three plus. And because it has zero AP, he's also not gonna get any benefits of the cover that he stood on. Jordan's failed three and he's passed three. Now each one of these has one damage. One of these damage points will go through and take off one wound off one of the models that Jordan has. So the Stern Guard veterans have two wounds each, which means it would require two of these dice to go through to inflict two damage on that model to remove it, and then the other damage spills over because it's a single damage attack onto the model next to it. Jordan can then allocate any of these wounds to the models that he has. He chooses who the wounds go on. He also chooses which models are removed. So now the models are removed and we'll then allocate any more shooting the unit has to onto the Dreadnought. So now we need to resolve the other two barbed gaunts that couldn't shoot with the Stern Guard veterans. They're shooting the Dreadnought, so they need to determine how many shots they're going to get. Michael's rolled a four and a one, so that's five total shots. And because he's fighting against a model with just one model, he's not going to get that blast benefit. So he needs to roll to hit on fours. The two that have been successful now need to wound. Now Michael's strength five but the toughness of this Dreadnought is toughness 10. Now, because the toughness of the vehicle is double Michael's strength, that's gonna require sixes to be rolled to wound here, which is incredibly unlikely. But Michael actually has pulled something miraculously out the bag here and actually rolled two sixes. So they are actually two successful wounds, and now Jordan needs to try and make a save of a two plus on this Dreadnought in order to keep the Dreadnought from being unharmed. I don't know how you've just done that. So now Jordan needs to roll those saves to see if he can keep the Dreadnought from being harmed, and he's completely fine with two plus saves. Now on the data sheet of the Barbed Gaunts, they have a really cool special ability. Now most units in the game do have their own unique rule. Theirs is called Disruption Bombardment, and they can pick an infantry unit that they shot at, and then in the next turn, so Jordan's next movement phase, they'll suffer a minus two to their movement characteristics, really slowing down that unit of those Stern Guard veterans. The next unit Michael fired was the Screamer Killer. However, due to the toughness of the Dreadnought, he was unable to hit and wound successfully. But it does have a special rule, which allows Michael to then pick that unit to take a Battle Shock check. Now this Battle Shock check may, if failed, then have negative consequences on Jordan's model. We won't be able to use any stratagems on it. Its OC, or its objective control, will go to zero, meaning it won't be any good at holding objectives whatsoever, 
and if it makes a fallback move, we'll have to take a test to see if it basically dies, explodes, or takes wounds. So now Jordan needs to roll above his leadership characteristic. He needs to roll this on two dice, and he needs to equal or exceed that value. And for the Dreadnought, it's a six plus. So that means Jordan needs to roll two dice, get a six, equal, or more. Jordan now needs to roll those two dice to see if he can exceed his leadership. However, the rule on the data sheet also modifies the dice by one. So now this result of a four is removed by one down to a three. That's under the six required. So therefore this is a failed test. This unit is now battle shocked and its OC will be zero and we won't be able to use any stratagems on the Dreadnought until the start of Jordan's next command phase. So once you've concluded the shooting phase, it's time for the charge phase. Now, in order to declare a charge, you need to be eligible. First of all, to be eligible, you need to be not in engagement range, which basically means not already in combat. The next thing is that you didn't advance in your movement phase, unless you've got a special rule that allows you to do so. And then the third thing is to make sure you've got a unit you can actually declare a charge against and in order to do so, you need one unit of yours within 12 inches of one or more enemy units. So the Leapers are within six inches of this unit of Infernus Marines. Now Michael, in order to make a successful charge here, needs to roll two dice and he needs to equal the distance required. And the distance required is five because you need to end within engagement range and that is one inch. So that five plus one is that six inches difference between the two units. Michael's rolled a nine, that completes his charge. Now when Michael makes a charge move, if possible, needs to put his models in base-to-base -base contact with one of Jordan's models. So Michael's now gonna move those models nine inches towards the closest model possible and get them in base-to-base -base contact. Now we've concluded the charge move, only one model was able to make it in base-to-base -base contact, but the others still need to remain in coherency, which is two inches of a friendly model, but also now within engagement range of one inch within one of Jordan's models to so that they can actually fight in the fight phase. So now we're gonna move on to the fight phase and we're gonna see what these leapers can do in combat. So we're now into the combat phase because there was no other charges Michael could make. So we're gonna look at the combat profile on the data sheet of the leapers they get six attacks per model. So Michael now needs to roll these six attacks just like we did in the shooting phase once more. So he needs to hit on threes. We need to remove any fails, which are all the ones in the twos because they are under the three required. Now Michael's strength is strength five. Jordan's toughness is toughness four. So that means Michael's gonna need threes in order to be successful. So again, removing any ones and twos from the pile. The armor penetration on these leapers is AP one which means we need to roll those three plus saves, and then we're gonna modify the dice. So any fours become threes, which also then pass, but the three now becomes a two, which now fails. So three have been unsuccessful, they failed, and these are one damage each. So now, like in the shooting phase, we need to allocate one of those points of damage to one of the wounds on those models. They've got two wounds each, so we're gonna lose one model, and one model's gonna take one wound. Now Michael's concluded his attacks, it's now time for Jordan to strike back. Now, Jordan has the opportunity, like everybody does in the fight phase, to do something called a pile-in move. Now this allows you to move one of your, or more models, within three inches to get as close as possible to the closest enemy model. And if doing so, you have to end in base-to-base -base contact. So Jordan's just gonna move that model now to make sure they can all fight and all attack. So Jordan can come through the wall and get within base-to-base -base contact of that leaper. Now these four remaining models can all fight because they're all in engagement range. Now Jordan gets to hit back, they've all piled in. They get three attacks per model, so 12 dice. They need threes in order to hit into combat, removing all of the ones and twos that are gonna fail. Now the toughness of these leapers is toughness five, but Jordan is only strength four. So that means he's gonna need a five or more in order to be successful. Two have been successful and the others have failed. So now this has got zero AP, so it's just on Michael's armor save in order to be successful. The leapers have a four up save, the one and the two have both failed, 
and these models do have three wounds each. So now one of these points of damage, which is two, needs to be allocated to one of those models, but it's not gonna mean any of those leapers are destroyed in this phase. So that concludes the combat phase. There's no other combats to fight with. So to kick off Jordan's turn one, both players will receive one command point in the clan phase, giving both players two command points total. We then need to check for any battle shock. Now any units already battle shocked at this point becomes unbattle shocked, like the Dreadnought had earlier. And then we now need to check for any units that are under half strength. To determine half strength, you need to look at the starting amount of wounds a model has. So for example, the Dreadnought, and if it goes below half, it's starting wounds, it's under half strength, or it's starting unit size. So if a unit is 10, as soon as it gets to that four mark, it's under half strength and then requires a battle shock for each of those units that are in that category. Once we've done that, which there are none of at present, we then move on to scoring. And in turn one, there's no points scored, so we go straight on to the movement phase. So Jordan's first of all gonna make a fallback move. Now to make a fallback move, he's basically running out of combat, his normal movement characteristic. And he's gonna move six inches, because that's what it says on his data sheet. Now this means he cannot advance during a fallback move and must end outside of an engagement range, which is that one inch of those leapers that he was in combat with before. The Dreadnought is going to decide to remain stationary. This is another type of move that you can get. And also, there's sometimes, if you've got the heavy keyword on your weapons, will give you some type of ability or benefit for remaining stationary. But as it doesn't need to move, it's got range to the entire battlefield, it can stay exactly where it is. The next unit that needs to move is the Stern Guard veterans. Now they, remember, have got minus two on their data characteristic and they just want to get within 12 inches of those leapers so that they can shoot them with their rapid fire combi weapons. Now you might be wondering where the Terminators and when they're gonna show up. Deep Strike or Reserves only allows you to come onto the tabletop from turn two onwards. So between turn two and turn three is when all those Deep Strikes need to come in. It's still turn one, so no Terminators as of yet. So we're now gonna move on to the shooting phase. To kick off the shooting phase, we're gonna start with the Stern Guard veterans. They've got a special rule on their combi weapon which says rapid fire. If you have this rule, if you get within half your total range, then if you are able to do so, you gain additional amount of shots based on what it says next to rapid fire. So for example, in this case, it says rapid fire one. That means Jordan will get one shot extra per model if he gets within half range of 24. So if he's within 12, which he is, he'll get an additional shot. So that means Jordan's gonna get eight shots in total for the four models here. Now Jordan needs to roll fives to hit. And the reason why it's fives is because any fours that would normally hit are actually modified down by one. And that's modified down by one because Michael has the stealth universal special rule. And anytime you see this, it just means you're gonna be a little bit harder to hit. So Jordan's rolled only four hits out of the eight. Now Jordan needs to wound. Now with a combi weapon, it says anti-infantry. This is another universal special rule. Anytime you see an anti then keyword, it only requires you to roll the dice next to where it says anti-infantry. So in this case, a four plus. And what this does is it turns anything that is a four into a six. And when a six is rolled, either naturally or through having the anti word, now means this is a critical wound roll. And a critical wound roll will now, because it has the devastating keyword on these combi weapons specifically, turn all of this damage straight into something we call mortal wounds. Now mortal wounds, there is no save against. No normal armor save, no invulnerable save. The only thing you could do is maybe use something like a feel no pain if you could shrug off that damage. In this case, Michael doesn't have any of those rules. So therefore Michael needs to allocate three of the damage because each of those damage that of the weapon, which is one, is now transferred into one mortal wound. One of those wounds is gonna kill the remaining model on a wound, and then the other two mortals are then gonna carry over to the next model. And mortal wounds always carry over, regardless of the damage inflicted. Next up is the Ballista Dreadnought, and the Ballista Dreadnought is gonna look at the Screamer Killer, 
get it in its sights and hopefully do as much damage as we possibly can. So the Blister's Dreadnought has a really cool inbuilt rule that allows it to actually re-roll its hit rolls so if you miss, you get another opportunity to re-roll some of those dice to convert them into hits. Now, you can only do this with the Dreadnought if the target unit is not under half strength, the Screamer Killer is completely fresh, so this rule will be in play. So we're going to kick off first of all with the two LAS Cannon shots. So we get two shots from the LAS Cannons, we need threes to hit, we have two successful hits. Now, if Jordan would have rolled a two, which would have failed, Jordan, because of this rule, could have picked up the two and then re-rolled it and hoped for another success. But as we roll two threes, we've got two successes. Now this is strength 12. This is more than the toughness of the Screamer Killer, which is only toughness nine, which means we need threes to wound. So we've got two successful wounds. The armor penetration is minus three. So Michael has a two plus save, which means he's gonna need to roll a five because it's gonna be modified by three in order to get there. Now, Michael's unfortunately failed both of those saves. He can at this time use a CP reroll if he chooses to maybe reroll one of the dice or he could save it. And this is using one of his precious command points. I think he's gonna go for it. So he's gonna use one of those two CPs to reroll one of those unsuccessfuls and try and hope for a five. So Michael has been successful. He's rolled a six, which means only one of these Laz Cannons has penetrated the Screamer Killer. Now we need to determine the damage. And it says D6. So this means, again, like we saw with the blast weapons, Jordan now needs to roll one dice. And this is exactly how much damage it's gonna do plus one because it says D6 plus one. So the Screamer Killer has just taken a massive seven wounds out of its starting 10. Next up, we've got a Rocket Launcher. Now the Rocket Launcher also gets two shots hits on threes. We've got two hits. It's strength 10 into toughness nine, which means we need threes to wound. We've got two wounds here, but the armor penetration is minus two. So Michael's gonna need fours in order to stay alive. We've got one fail, so that means there is a chance the Screamer Killer could go down to the Blister's Dreadnought. So Jordan needs to roll a D6 in order to determine the damage, and he's only rolled a one, which means the Screamer Killer is gonna be alive with two wounds left. We concluded the Storm Bolters and nothing happened because what could you expect from a strength four weapon into a toughness with a two up save? It's not happening. Next up, we've got the Infernus Marines. Now the Infernus Marines cannot shoot, and the reason why they cannot shoot is because they made that fallback move, and that does prevent them this turn from shooting. So that concludes the shooting phase. We're now gonna move on to the charge phase, but it doesn't look like Jordan wants to make any charges because his units are built for shooting rather than combat. So he's gonna stay outside of combat this turn. So we're gonna skip the charge phase. We're gonna skip the combat phase and we're gonna go straight to Michael's turn two. It's battle round two and we once again start with Michael. So both players once again get a command point taking Jordan up to three and Michael up to two because he spent one earlier on that command point reroll. So now Michael needs to check for battle shock and the only unit that is under its half strength is the Screamer Killer. So Michael needs to roll two dice and roll equal to or over its leadership. Michael's rolled a seven which is under the eight needed so that is a fail which means his objective control is now zero and that is no good for holding the middle objective but there is a stratagem Michael can use. And that stratagem is called Insane Bravery. It's one CP, and basically this allows Michael to ignore that result and remain unharmed from battle shock. So I think it's probably a good idea Michael does that because it would allow Michael to score some points as he goes into his turn two, giving the Tyranids a lead in this game. That does mean at the end of the command phase, Michael will score the five points for the take and hold mission because he is the only person with OC, or should I say, Michael's OC is greater than Jordan's in the middle, and objective range is three inches. So what you need to do is check how many units are within three inches of any part of that objective. It is only Michael's, and therefore, Michael will get those all important five points. Now we head on to the movement phase for the Tyranids. So Michael's gonna make a normal move with the Leapers, getting to the other side of the Dreadnought. The Barbed Gaunts have decided to remain stationary because they're already in range and they have the heavy keyword, 
which we're going to cover later, but that's going to actually improve Michael's accuracy when it comes to shooting. The Screamer Killer is making a normal move over the objective and then getting nice and close to those Infernus Marines, allowing a charge later on in the turn. And now Michael's making a normal move with those Gaunts, getting them onto the objective and putting more OC on that objective to try and hold that from Jordan as we go into Jordan's next turn. Now Michael's finished that move with the Gaunts, However, there is a stratagem, a reactive stratagem that Jordan can play called Overwatch. This is an incredibly powerful stratagem that basically allows Jordan to shoot any unit in his army within 24 inches of that unit that either starts a move or ends a move. Now this stratagem can only be played once per turn which means Jordan's gonna use it now and hopefully flame throw some of those gaunts down as they move into that objective. So with Overwatch, you normally can only hit on a six, which means you're very unlikely to actually hit regardless of how many shots you have. However, these flamethrowers have the torrent keyword. And this torrent keyword means that once you've determined how many shots you get, you don't need to roll to hit. So they automatically hit, meaning when you combine Torrent and Overwatch together, it's incredibly powerful. So Jordan has four models within range of its gun, which is 12. Within 12 of this Gaunt unit here, so we need to determine the amount of shots. He's got 14 shots. That also means 14 hits, because he doesn't need to roll to hit. Jordan's strength is five, and Michael's toughness is three, so he needs three to wound. We remove all the ones and twos. Now Michael is on terrain and any models that are wholly on the terrain feature, so on the footprint, would normally get plus one to their saving throw because they're receiving the benefits of cover. However, Jordan has the ignores cover keyword, so there is no terrain benefit whatsoever, so Michael is just on his armor save. Michael's passed five and failed six. Each of these are one damage each on those one wound gaunts, so that does mean six gaunts have just been absolutely torched. Yeah, ready, let's do it. Now the Overwatch has been completed, the Tyranid Prime can now make its move, moving 12 inches, and it can fly over or through its own units. Now there's one more stratagem that I know Jordan wants to play, and it's called Rapid Ingress. Those Terminators that were in Deep Strike can spend one command point to now enter the battlefield, actually in Michael's turn. Normally they would come into Deep Strike, in Jordan's turn, but this allows him to skip a stage and actually come in right now at the end of Michael's movement phase. So Jordan can set this unit of Terminators up anywhere on the table, providing that they are over nine inches away from any enemy model. So the start of the shooting phase, we're gonna kick off with the barbed gaunts. They only have 24 inch range, which is why it's incredibly important for Michael at this time to shoot them first because if he was to shoot another unit and take some of them out of range, they wouldn't no longer be able to shoot. And if you want more great tactics like this, then consider following Vanguard Tactics. So the Barbed Gaunts, they get those D6 shots each, and remember their blast, but the unit is under five, so no blast benefit, no extra shots. He's only gonna get what Michael can roll. Michael's got 17 hits, but this weapon has the heavy keyword, and if you have the heavy keyword and remain stationary, you get plus one to the hit roll. So normally, he would need fours, but any threes, we're gonna add one to it, and they're gonna become successes. So we've got 13 hits. They're strength five, toughness four, so we need threes to wound. So we remove all the ones and twos. Jordan needs to make his three plus save. Jordan's failed three. These are all single damage each. So one of them, it will pip off the last wound on the wounded model. And then the two more damage will go through and kill one more. So that is a total of two Stern Guard veterans killed. The next up is the Screamer Killer. And he's also gonna target the Stern Guard veterans. It gets D6 plus three shots. We've got a total of seven shots here. We hit on fours. Remove all the fails. Now this is strength eight. Because that is double the toughness of Jordan's Marines, he's only gonna need twos to wound. We've got three successes. So the armor penetration is minus two. So that would normally mean Jordan needs fives in order to be successful. However, because his models are wholly on the terrain feature and there is some AP to this value, that means we are gonna get the benefits of cover. AP value on this is minus two. 
However, Jordan is in cover, so we'll get a plus one to his saving throw. So therefore, it would normally be a five because of the minus two, but we get a plus one to that, bringing it back down to a four plus. Jordan has failed two. These are one damage each, and that's going to kill one more stern guard. Jordan had to take that battle shock check because of the rules and was able to successfully pass that one. Now we've only got one unit left to shoot and that is these Termagants. They've already lost six models and they've got one shot each going in that remaining stern guard. So it's 14 shots hitting on fours. Jordan's got a three plus save. Let's hope he passes some. He has failed two. So that means the remaining stern guard is dead. That concludes the shooting phase. Now it is onto the charge phase. Now this would be an ideal time to use the Overwatch stratagem because you could also use that in the charge phase. However, it is only once per turn and Jordan's already used it. So it's onto Michael can charge with free reign knowing that there's no more Overwatch. So again, he cannot charge if he's already in combat. He can't charge any units that are outside of 12 inches and he can't charge any units that advance this turn. So Michael's first of all gonna charge with the Leapers into the Dreadnought. He's obviously made it, he's rolled an eight, and because he can end eight inches in base to base, he absolutely has to do that. Next up is the Screamer Killer. He's rolled a three, and that is just enough to get him within engagement range and base to base of those Infernus Marines. And then he's finally got the Tyranid Prime. He's rolled a six, again, allowing him to end base to base contact with these Infernus Marines. And that concludes the charge phase. It's finally time for the Screamer Killer to see how ferocious he can actually be in combat. Now the Screamer Killer has 10 attacks. He's looking for threes to hit, so we're gonna remove all the fails. So that's three are gonna fail. We're then strength 10, so we need twos to wound here. We've got six saving throws to make. Now this is minus two AP. There is no cover because you do not get cover in combat, which means Jordan does need a five plus in order to save his models. In every single fail, we'll kill an Infernus Marine because it's flat damage three. He has failed five, he's actually failed all six, which means the entire unit is obliterated from the face of the planet. We've concluded the attacks on the Screamer Killer, the models have been removed, which now allows Michael to consolidate three inches if he can get within engagement range. And remember, that's one inch. Now, Michael Screamer Killer was within four inches of the Dreadnought, which allows him to move three and get within that ever important engagement range. So this does mean the Dreadnought could attack and maybe kill that Screamer Killer if he's lucky. And if not, then the Screamer Killer is gonna destroy that Dreadnought next turn. Now, next up is the Tyranid Prime. So the Tyranid Prime is over four inches away from the Dreadnought, which means it cannot pile in to get an engagement range. So the only thing left it can do is consolidate towards the closest objective if and only if it's within six inches because you can consolidate three inches and then you need to end within three inches of that objective marker range so it can move back a little bit to claim this objective in the middle we concluded the leapers off camera and as you can probably imagine did absolutely nothing to a dreadnought with that two up save and only wounding on fives and sixes next up we're going to go with the dreadnought so after all the units have charged because they get to fight first by charging. That's a benefit from charging. You gain the fight first keyword, so therefore we resolve all the fight firsts. Now, any units that don't have that keyword, such as the Dreadnought, now get to fight, and we would actually alternate. The so next up, we've got the Dreadnought. Now, the Dreadnought is gonna attack those Leapers. It gets five attacks hitting on threes, but it no longer gets that reroll because it only works with ranged attacks. He's only had one, two successes. He's wounding on threes because it's strength seven into toughness five that's one wound zero ap we're looking for a four up that fails and that kills the model with only one wound remaining so now it's jordan's turn two and it's time for a command point for both players taking both jordan and michael up to two cps to spend on any of those core stratagems we're also going to see if jordan needs to take any battle shock However, Michael didn't just take those units to half strength, he absolutely obliterated them. So there is no battle shot required for Jordan. We're then gonna see if Jordan scores any points and Jordan has zero models within range of that objective. So Jordan is gonna score zero points on the primary objective, but it's still only early days and hopefully Jordan can make a comeback in later turns of the game. So now we're on to the movement phase for the Space Marines. Let's see if they can crush the alien scum. So we're gonna start with the Dreadnought, and it's already in combat. Now, 
The Dreadnought has a really cool rule called Big Guns Never Tire. So if it stays in combat, it is actually, on the rare occasion, able to shoot because it is a vehicle or a monster and has the Big Guns Never Tire keyword. So Jordan's going to remain stationary with the Dreadnought and hopefully just shoot the Screamer Killer into Annihilation. But he does have that unit of Terminators left and they're going to move a flat five inches towards either the objective or another unit that they might choose to shoot or charge later on. So to kick off the shooting phase, we're going to start with the Terminators and Jordan has decided to shoot the Barbed Gaunts. So these Storm Bolt was a Rapid Fire 2. They get two shots plus the additional two, which it says Rapid Fire 2, giving four shots per model for a total of 16 shots. Now the Librarian gives a really cool rule called Sustained Hits when he's leading the unit, which he is. Now every time Jordan rolls a critical hit roll, which is basically every time you roll a six, that's going to trigger the sustained rule. Now the sustained hits for every hit you get gives you an additional hit. If it, for example, says sustain one, you get one additional hit. If it said sustain two, you would get two additional hits. So Jordan puts one more dice in because that counts as one extra hit for that one roll of a six. We're now looking at strength four into toughness four, meaning we need fours on the wound roll. Now Michael has a four up save. However, because all the models are getting the benefits of cover, and they do not originally have a three plus save, we add plus one to their saving throw, meaning Michael is looking for threes in order to be successful. Now the Barb Gaunt's got two wounds each, four damage has gone through, so that does take four wounds off the unit and therefore kills two Barb Gaunts. Next up is the classic Assault Cannon, the most, one of the most nostalgic weapons in the game. This gets six shots. It is hitting on threes. It's missed four times, however, this is a strength six weapon, meaning we are looking for threes to wound, but because we did roll one six, that gives you one additional hit because of the Librarian. We're looking for threes, we've got two successful wound rolls, but the six is a devastating wound because that is a critical wound roll of a six that inflicts one mortal straight away, no save required, and then Michael has to make two more armor saves. He's failed one, and the mortal wound would then kill one more model. So next up is the Librarian. It's going to unleash a smite attack. This is a psychic power, and he's gone to essentially overcharge this attack. It's making it a lot more damaging and a lot more powerful. It's D6 shots. We've got a three. We roll three hit rolls on a three up to be successful. We've got three successful hits. Now this is strength six and toughness four, so we only need threes to wound. That is two successful wounds. Now each of these are minus two AP, but, Michael is going to get the benefits of cover. One is passed and one is failed. This is a D3 damage attack. So a D3, you might be wondering what's that? Well, you roll a D6, and if you roll a one or a two, the result is a one. If you roll a three or a four, the result is a two. And if you roll a five or a six, it's going to be a result of a three. We've got a three that does two damage, killing a two wound model. Now it's time for that hazardous check. In order to do that, any unit that fired a hazardous weapon or psychic ability has to roll a dice. On the result of a one, either one of the models, if it's a non-vehicle, non-monster, or non-character model, will just be slain, or if it is a character vehicle or monster, it will just take three wounds. So do not roll a one, otherwise you could suffer the perils. You've rolled a three, you've successfully passed your hazardous check and you are okay to proceed. So next up, we've got the Dreadnought to shoot. Now the Dreadnought's gonna allocate all of its shots to try and take down that Screamer Killer. So that's the Storm Bolters, the Rocket Launchers and the Laz Cannons. Now this is a vehicle, so it does get the rule benefit of Big Guns Never Tire, which does allow it to shoot in combat. However, it will suffer a minus one to hit because clearly it's just harder to hit something when they're that close. So Jordan needs to roll two shots for those last cannons to see if they can hit, and we're looking for fours. We no longer get that re-rolls because it's no longer over its half strength. So therefore it's only one hit. We're looking for a three to wound. We've rolled a four. So this will successfully wound, but this is AP three, meaning that Michael needs to roll anything but a five or a six. He's rolled a one. Now, Michael could re-roll this, but with the amount of shots left, it's probably not worth the idea. So, this is gonna be D6 plus one damage. So this literally cannot fail, because even if Jordan rolls a one, which he rolls a four, we add plus one to it because of the Laz Cannon rule of D6 plus one, taking the last two wounds off the Screamer Killer. 
So the Screamer Kill is dead, but however, it has a rule called Deadly Demise. Now on a 6 plus, it essentially explodes or lashes out as it goes down and it might inflict some mortal wounds. It doesn't, so therefore, Jordan is unfortunately got off safe from the Screamer Killers being destroyed. Now the rockets, the storm bolters that were also allocated to that Screamer Killer, at this point cannot be allocated anywhere else. So therefore, all those shots are wasted and we now just need to remove the Screamer Killer. So that concludes the shooting phase, so it's just time for now Jordan to try and make his charge into the Termagant. He's within seven, so that means you need a six. He's rolled a nine, which allows him to move all of his models, obviously keeping coherency, nine inches towards the Gaunt and getting every model that can into base-to-base -base contact without ending his move on the objective. So now we're in the combat phase. We start with all the units that have the fight first keyword. So that is any charging units or the leapers. Now, when units have the fight first keyword, they're gonna fight at the top level, okay? So they're gonna fight before anybody else. And we always start with the non-active player. And the non-active player is Michael. So Michael gets to select his leaper, first of all, to fight into that dreadnought. We resolved the attacks and the leaper did absolutely nothing to that dreadnought with its two plus save being only minus one AP. So now it's time to see what the Terminators can do in combat. Now, not all models are in base-to-base -base contact, so that does mean Jordan can make a three-inch piling move to get any models in base-to-base -base contact. And if they cannot end within three, what they can do is end within base-to-base -base contact of another model of its same unit that is also in base-to-base -base contact. So this librarian is base-to-base -base with this Gaunt, and this Terminator is now base-to-base -base with this guy, which allows him to fight through that model as well. So it essentially allows you to fight in two ranks, providing all those models are base-to-base -base and base-to-base. -base. It's Terminator time, and the Terminators have four power fists in the squad, and one of the Terminators has a power sword. So we're just gonna resolve all of the power fists first of all. They get three attacks each, they hit on threes. Any sixes explode because of the Librarian or sustain, so they'll put in two additional hits now because we rolled two sixes. Then we are strength eight on toughness three, which means we're needing twos because we are double the toughness. All of them have been successful, so that will mean each of these, because it's minus two AP, will go straight through the armor of the Tormagaunt and kill a model per one that is successful. So that means 12 Gaunts are now absolutely obliterated. One thing to note here is that the Terminators do have a two damage weapon, but damage doesn't carry over. So although the Gaunts only have one wound each, the two damage just stops at that one wound model. It's only mortal wounds where the damage would continue to spill. So it's only 12 models, although it technically would have caused 24 damage in total. Next up is the Sergeant with the Power Sword. It's four attacks, hitting on threes, we have a sustained hit, means that one miss basically goes back in. We're looking for threes to wound, and an AP2 will slay any model because it's only five up saves. That kills the rest of the squad, and therefore all those models will be removed. So we've concluded all the Terminator's attacks, and the entire unit has been destroyed. That does mean the Librarian will not have anything to attack because at this point he's not in engagement range of anybody else. So once we've finished the attack sequence for the Terminators, they can consolidate. They can consolidate up to three inches, if they so wish, into the closest enemy model. Now they can get within engagement range of the Prime, and it's probably a good idea to do so, so it can't move away and charge something else. So by tagging it, means that it has to stay in combat next turn. So the Terminators have finished their consolidation move, and they are within engagement range of the Tyranid Prime, which does allow it to actually activate because you can either fight after you've charged, or if you find yourself in engagement range, you can then attack. So in this case, the Tyranid Prime can start to put all of its attacks onto the Terminator unit, or if you've got some command points left like Michael has, you can do an epic challenge. Now the epic challenge allows you to target that character model in that unit. So instead of just putting all the attacks on the Terminators, the bodyguards, to soak up those wounds, you can actually directly target that character unit and try and kill the Warlord. So Michael, by spending that one CP, gets the precision rule, and that allows him to do this. So all these attacks can now be allocated to the Librarian. He gets six attacks, hitting on twos. Michael's got six hits. He's strength six into toughness five, which means he needs threes to wound. He's got five wounds, and these are AP one and two damage each. 
this could actually kill the Librarian. Let's see what he rolls. Jordan has rolled a 1, a 1, and a 2, but because it's AP1, this 2 is reduced by 1, meaning that we have now 3 fails. Each of those are 2 damage each. That's 6 total wounds on the character, but he's only got 5, so that means the Librarian has been utterly destroyed by that Tyranid Prime. We resolved the Dreadnought's combat and it didn't do anything to the Leaper either, so that concludes our game for today and we would normally play this out to a natural conclusion at the end of Battle Round 5, but we want to leave you in suspense and hopefully bring you back to watch some of our more epic 40k battle reports in the future. We play 2,000 points, so much larger games, and really helping you through all those processes through a little bit of entertainment, but mainly education. Our ethos is all about sportsmanship and fair play, and we really want to help you improve your gameplay in the awesome game that is Warhammer 40,000 10th edition. And if you want to pick up your Leviathan box, do check out some of the links below as it really helps us and also our sponsors of the channel. But before we continue, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, The Outpost. If you're looking for a great deals on your miniatures, paints and gaming supplies, we've got you covered. Their wide variety of exceptional service makes them the go-to destination for all hobby needs. So don't wait, check out The Outpost today. Link in the description below. And one final thing, a massive thank you to Games Workshop for not only making this incredible hobby for us to enjoy, but also for sending us this preview box to actually show to you. And if you have enjoyed this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and write below exactly what you found useful and if you found this video helpful. So we'll see you on some more epic battle reports, and take care.